So we continue our series in the book of Acts, chapter 4, uh, picking up from verses 32 to 37. This is titled, A Radical Gospel Community. A Radical Gospel Community. And so before we get into our text again, here's a question that I have for you. What does a community changed by the gospel look like? What does a community that has been changed or is being changed by the gospel look like? Last week we saw in chapter 4 uh, that in the face of opposition, the apostles trusted in God's sovereignty and in the power of prayer. There in verse 31 it says that when they had prayed, the entire place was shaken and they continued to speak the word of God, God with all boldness. And so we saw that the preaching of God's word was so effective that it radically changed their entire community. And so in our passage here, today we're going to follow three insights again. And number one, it is this, the unity beneath the surface. The unity beneath the surface. Number two, we'll see the power to testify of Jesus. Number three, we'll see the grace to share our treasures. Number one, the unity beneath the surface. Verse 32, now the full number of those who were believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. Notice the church here is portrayed as uh, those who believed. Luke says, Luke the writer says, that the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And so there was this oneness of heart, isn't it? There was this unity that was below the surface level. And so it says, notice carefully, that this group of believers are described as those who believed the gospel. The question I pose to you today again is, do you believe the gospel at a heart level? So I'm not asking you a Sunday question, Sunday school question, whether or not you, you can tick off a statement that says, yes, I believe in the gospel. I'm asking you a question, do you believe the gospel in the heart? It says those who believe were of one heart and soul. This was not external harmony or superficial harmony, isn't it? Uh, this is not unity in conformity. Uh, this was a oneness of heart beneath the surface. This is unity on the inside. This is called the inside out gospel. That the gospel was working in them and they were united in as one. And so where have we seen this unity before? You remember in uh, chapter 1 verse 14, it says that with one accord, there again, the language of unity, they were devoting themselves to prayer. Again in chapter 2 verse 46, it says, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Again, notice the language, hearts. So this was a radically different community from the superficial harmony that we see in this society. There was no pretending and performing. There was no facade, there was no professionalism, but a great sense of oneness of our heart and soul. Do you see how this community, again, cuts to the very heart of modern spirituality? Uh, there is an individualistic spirituality that is united with believers in community. You will not find that in the Bible, right? So if you're resisting community at a hard level, at a very hard level, you're cutting yourself off from the very life that God had designed for you. And it, it's amazing, we see this, I don't have time to go again, if I can bring uh, to, you, uh, you, to your memory what happened in the Garden of Eden. When things went wrong, what happened? When man resists the 
the things that God has designed for him, it doesn't go well, isn't it? And that's where we are today, and we see all the curse, the brokenness of the fall, all around the society, even in a society that is glittering on the outside. So when we resist the community that God has designed for us, we are cutting ourselves off from the very life God intended for us. And so if you make an idol, here's what I want to say. If you, want, if you make an idol, an idol is anything that you value and treasure more than who God is, right? More than God. If you make an idol of your individual choice, you not only miss out on community, it leads to loneliness. There is pervasive loneliness after the pandemic. Right? Coming out of COVID, we now realize all the community that had, we have been building the foundations on were not as deep. You see divisions everywhere. You see very fragile, fragmented communities. No wonder there is a pandemic of loneliness in this nation. So have, how many of you have heard of the word kodokushi in Japanese? Yeah? Kodokushi is a Japanese phenomenon of dying out of sight. This aging population is dying out of sight in loneliness with no one to care for. This is a Japanese phenomenon. It's death by loneliness, that's a term, kodokushi. And it's happening in a modern, advanced, technologically, scientifically advanced society. The pandemic of loneliness. See, if we run from the church whenever it's boring or uncomfortable, we are, near, we are not really following the crucified Jesus. The call of the crucified Jesus was to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow him. It was not a call of comfort, you see. And we experience that in the relationships, in the fragile communities that we are a part of. How can we encourage one another without sharing our hearts? You see, there was one heart and soul, oneness of heart and soul, or without sharing our struggles, sins and weaknesses, right? Even in verses 23 and 31, we saw last week, when the apostles were released from the prison, from the Jewish Supreme Court, what happened? They went and prayed with their friends immediately. The apostles lived in community. In other words, one heart and soul means this, that you're no, longer, uh, you're no longer guarded, right? You're no longer keeping your distance from others. It means, uh, finally, you're starting to become vulnerable. You're opening up yourselves. It takes risk, right? But that's what the gospel works in you. It's about letting others into your life. Notice the heart here is the center and the seed of the spiritual life. It's your inner being that's being renewed by the Holy Spirit. That same word is used in Deuteronomy 6.5. There's a parallel here where it says, you shall, you know this verse, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and with all your might. Right? So, how did this early church show that? How did they show their love for God and others? Look at the next phrase. It says, no one said that any of the things that belong to him were his own. What is going on here? <laughs> you are not your own anymore, if you're a believer, that is. You belong to Christ in community, in the community of Christ, and nothing that you own is ultimately yours. You do not choose the time and place and the country in which you were born. You didn't choose it. Nothing that you have that you bring to the table before God is yours. See, a heart that has been transformed, has been touched by the gospel of grace, sees that everything is owing to God's grace, and we'll get to that in a moment. But look at this. The gospel has touched the way they looked at their belongings. Do you see this? Have you seen a community like this? See, they were not just sharing their hearts, they were ready to share even their belongings, it says. Verse 37, no one said any of the things that belonged to him was his own. The gospel had touched the way they looked at their belongings. Has the gospel loosened your grip on your belongings? Oh, materialism and the greed behind it. 
greed destroys societies more than anything else. Yeah, you see this beautiful society? Glorious, as it were, a global major city on the outside, glittering. And there, there is a mad competition of the social ladder and the power ladder, right? You don't mind stepping on someone else's toe as long as you can put yourself up, you see. Greed does that. Power, idolatry does that. And yet look at how the gospel has touched them in their hearts. They were sharing their hearts. They were one, they were one in community. And then they were saying, no one said any of the things that belonged to him was his own. The gospel has touched their hearts so deeply that they were ready to share their belongings, you see. See, the gospel was really beginning to do its work in them. And it says they had everything in com common. What does that mean? Much later, when Paul wrote about unity in chapter four, uh, Ephesians 4, he said this. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. My, my goodness, this is beautiful. Those who were believed were of one heart and soul, and then they were of one body, with one spirit, the Holy Spirit, one Lord Jesus Christ, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. This is what bound them together as one great community, and they continued to testify of Jesus' resurrection. Next we see the power to testify of Jesus. Verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. I just love this phrase, this sentence here. Notice how it says, with great power, uh, that Greek word, mighty work, strength, might, miraculous work. Where did they get this great power from? In chapter 1, verse 8, remember Jesus had said, as we have seen, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. And so they were continuing to bear witness with great power as Jesus had said. See, Remember, the, al the early church was a praying church. Right? This was a praying church right from the start we saw last week. In fact, it was the prayer and the filling of the Holy Spirit in verse 31 that, that had given them this new boldness. They couldn't depend on yesterday's boldness and courage. They needed that boldness. And they prayed for it and they received it. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And so here they were testifying with great power to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, the Holy Spirit gives you power, believer, to make Jesus known. You see, sometimes many of us come into global cities, right? So city centers are centers of education, wealth, and power. Global cities, centers of education, wealth, and power. Your job got you here, some of you. But I don't believe it was your job that brought you here. I believe it was the Lord who brought you here. We don't believe in coincidences, do we, right? No, see, we need to reimagine our faith as participating in God's mission to our work, to our vocation. The gospel in the workplace as one of our gospel DNA. The integration of your Christian faith in your workplace, right? The Holy Spirit gives you the power to make Jesus known, even in the way that you work. It says they were giving their testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. That word testimony here means to be a witness in a courtroom, to testify, right? It's where we get the word martyr, marturios, martyr. Somebody who dies as a martyr. These early disciples were willing to die for their faith. In fact, as we saw, remember that they were put on trial at the Jewish Supreme Court by the Sanhedrin in verse 7. And the religious leaders had commanded them, threatened them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And we have seen that they couldn't keep silent. How could they keep silent about this great glorious resurrection message? And yet despite all the threats, the apostles here continue to testify with great power, it says. And notice with me, who is at the center of their testimony? 
Jesus is the center of their testimony. They were not just telling nice stories about themselves, right? It says they were testifying to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And so I, I want to ask you, when was the last time you shared your testimony with someone? Your testimony is powerful. Do you know why? Because your testimony is about who Jesus is and what he has done for you. At the very center of your testimony is the saving message of Jesus. It's who Jesus is and his glorious power, resurrection power that is at work in you. A shared life, so in community means that our testimonies, we share our testimonies inside and outside the church. You open up your hearts, you open up your stories, you tell people how God's grace has brought you to where you are today. So who are the people in your church and workplace that God has put around you this season? I've been personally enjoying asking the question to myself, who are the people around me? When you share your testimony of God's saving grace, it encourages others, it inspires others, it builds up others, it matures others in their faith. It encourages me. When you share your testimony, it builds up others because each one of you in this room, if you're a believer, you have a unique story of God's saving grace. So Luke says, notice, with great power, the apostles were testifying to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not a believer today and you're here, I want to tell you that at the heart of the Christian faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You can strip away everything you want, but you have to deal with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Christian message is different from every other religion, you see. Resurrection, that language, resurrection means Christianity is not moralism. That Christianity is not how to be a good person. The language of resurrection implies that Christianity is not about how to be, uh, how I can be a good person in front of God. The resurrection of Christ shows that to be right with God, you need to be raised from death to life. That is at the heart of the Christian faith. And that topples down every other religious beliefs that in order to, be, uh, to have a connection with God, I need to do this and receive some form of karma. That's where I come from in India. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. The apostles were teaching and preaching in the power, the power of Jesus' resurrection. Back in verse 27, the apostles were talking about how the rulers and the Israelites crucified Jesus. But all that was in vain because Jesus is now risen, as we saw. So the apostles were testifying to who Christ is, his death, his life, and his resurrection, right? And great grace was upon them, Luke says. What really gave them boldness to witness was this, that Christ has indeed risen again, that he is at the right hand of God, ruling and reigning in power. By the time we get to the book of Acts, we know Christ is risen. He's at the right hand of God. Notice it says, great power and great grace. Beautiful language. With great power, they testified to Jesus' resurrection. And great grace was upon them all. Resurrection of Christ. Christ is exalted. Grace came upon all of them. Beautiful. God's grace has come to us at the cost of his own son. So finally we see the grace to share our treasures. Verse 34. There was not a needy person among them, for as many were owners of the lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. I'm going to spend time on this a little bit. So track with me. Previous verse, it says, great grace was upon them. Verse 34 says now, there was not a needy person among them. This is an echo of Deuteronomy 15.4. There it was prophesied that no poor people would be there when the Israelites finally settled in the land. 
So here, that ideal was lived out by the early church. There was no needy person among them because great grace was upon them all. (laughs) See, when God's grace lavishes your heart, this is what happened, ravishes your heart, greed starts to lose its power. When God's grace has a grip on your heart, greed starts to lose its power. The idols of your hearts, the things that you treasure, starts to lose their significance. And they no longer control your emotions. If you idolize material comfort, your mind is always on it. Your mind is always fixated. It's what you meditate on, think about on, and it eats you up from the inside and it affects your emotions. Sometimes out of control, right? When God's grace ravishes your heart, greed loses power over you. God's grace is not a license to remain stingy. We see it here. There was not a needy person among them, right? Why? For as many were owners of lands or houses, sold them. This was voluntary. This was not demanded by the apostles. Right? No one told them to sell their possessions and yet as great, great grace came upon them, as Christ was preached, as Jesus was lifted up in the power of his resurrection and grace came upon them, they brought the proceeds of what was sold, verse 35, and laid it at apostles' feet. What was going on here? Why do we want houses or lands? Let me ask you this question. Why do you want houses or lands? Well, the basic answer is, Pastor Joe, you say, that's such a foolish question to ask. We need a place to uh, seek refuge and we need a shelter. Yes, I agree. God provides, right? But why do we need houses and lands? In the city, you see, Tokyo, if you're reading or not, uh, lands and houses are symbols of status, security, and wealth. Sometimes people find their identity in the kinds of apartments that they live, designer apartments. Your sense of word and value is so tied to that because it's a sign of wealth. There's peer pressure from your friends saying, ah, they're, lo- they're living in a high-rise building. Oh, those poor fellows, they're living on the first floor in an age-old building where an earthquake can destroy. Oh, look at us, see. I'm living up, up there. This is true, I talk to people all the time. You find your identity on things that are glittering on outside that can be taken away from you in a split second like that, right? So it's not stable, it's not something that you want to build your identity on, right? Here we see that they brought the proceeds of what they had sold, they didn't go and invest it and make an investment uh, into real estate. <laughs> brought the proceeds of what was sold, laid at the apostles' feet, something radically transforming was happening in their heart. In Japan, there are many abandoned houses. So I did a research. If you look up the Ministry of, um, uh, what's that? The Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs and Communications. If you check it up, about 2015, somewhere there, there was about four point something million abandoned houses in Japan due to aging population and because in many of those places they are in the inakas, in the village areas and the young people have moved on to the cities. Abandoned houses where no one is living. As a song famously tells us by Ray F. Miller, I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. God's grace is not a license to stingy. God's grace, in fact, leads to incredible grace-motivated generosity. This was voluntary generosity. In other words, houses and lands do not last forever. What is yours now might become someone else's property one day. This world is not your permanent home. So the early disciples were living generously in light of the coming eternal reality, making an investment into eternal reality so that there they will find their treasures. See, the gospel reveals what your treasure is. 
Verse 35 says it was distributed as any had need, as they saw the coming future reality of Christ and his kingdom and all the glories and the inheritances they have possessed already because of what Jesus has done. They looked at the needs around them and said, how can we meet their needs? And they distributed the needs as any had need. They were sensitive to the needs of the body for they were one body, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one Savior. Incredible. Do you see how the church is a radically different community from a consumer culture? You enter a restaurant or shopping mall, you are dissatisfied and you go to the next one. The early church did not approach church like consumers. As great grace came upon them, they met the needs of others generously. Verse 36 says, Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levi, the native of Cyprus, he sold, son of encouragement, sold the field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. What is going on? Why is Barnabas mentioned here? Barnabas was fully committed, committed to that community. He was exemplary. That's why he was picked probably because of his character and became Paul's missionary journey friend. He is a contrast to Ananias and Sapphira, which we'll see next week in chapter five. See, Barnabas means son of encouragement. He was an encourager. So what does this encourager do? Verse 37 says, he sold a field and belo that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Encouragement is not just words, but also indeed in action, in generosity. Right? He brought the money, laid it at apostles' feet. This is sacrificial love. How can we be an encouragement to others? In the community, we give and receive words of encouragement, words of affirmation. We call out the gifts of others that they don't even know they have. We encourage them where they are in their struggles, in their workplaces. We lend, we lend a listening ear. You become others oriented because of the grace you have received. We offer prayers of encouragement to one another. We say, how can I pray for you? But en encouragement must also be accompanied by deeds, right? So words, how many of you know words do not cost us person personally? It doesn't cost cost me anything to say Jesus loves you how can I encourage you pull up my Bible verse pray with you words do not cost us sacrificial love always costs us personally when you give to the needs of others in the church it costs you personally who does Barnabas remind you of See, this is costly encouragement, costly grace, not cheap grace. Sin makes us slaves even to money and possessions, but grace, grace has come to us at the cost of Jesus' very life. Jesus, in fact, is the true son of encouragement who gave up his all for us, as Paul later said in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich, you see. He says, for you know, you know, not only in your heads, that this is a Sunday school theology, <laughs> but you know it in your hearts, you've tasted the grace of God. You know with the knowing of your hearts, not with the knowing of your minds only, where it doesn't drop, the, the coin drops at some point, and your heart is ravished by the glorious grace of Jesus Christ, that this is not just abstract theology or some kind of abstract thing, it's ravishing you. You know, you've tasted it. He's writing here, don't have time, to, to poor, uh, sorry, rich Corinthians, making an example of the Macedonian poor Christians who lived a life of generosity as God's grace was working. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at great grace that has come upon you, the Bridge Fellowship. You know not only in your head, but in your heart, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. Jesus saw your spiritual poverty and came. He came. He saw your spiritual emptiness and the eternal 
poverty that was going to rob you of the very life of God. And he came. He left the comfort and the riches of his father's house to die the debt that you and I deserve. He died in poverty so that you, by his poverty, might become rich eternally. Go heirs with Christ. <laughs> Read Romans. Made co heirs with Christ, the glorious inheritance coming, stored up for you. Christ has done it all, He's purchased that for you. And out of that resources, you reach out to others. Jesus has given you two riches and security that houses and lands cannot give you. Therefore, look around you. Who needs encouragement in this room? In the fellowship time, even this afternoon? Who needs a helping hand? Uh, what needs are there in this church, in the body of Christ? The early church gave beyond tithes and offerings. They sold their houses and lands. Who needs a listening ear? Who needs your presence? Who is sick and suffering? Who needs food? Who needs a prayer of encouragement? Do you know your neighbor, right? So don't wait for others to do what you see as a need. Don't wait for others to do what you see as a need. Ask, what has God given me? What has, Lord, what have you entrusted to me? What have you put before me? How can I meet the needs of others with my time, resources, and energy? Because you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, you can now know others, open up, and meet others in their place of need. Amen. Let's pray together.